has made this day for us. And we ought to be willing to live it for him. This is the Advent season, the season of beginnings, where all believers celebrate and worship the coming of the Christ child. He is the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. And I don't know how you feel, but I am glad to be in the house one more time. Glad to be here alive one more time. And if you're glad to be in church this morning, come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <clears throat> amen, amen. I, I must admit that um, I missed being here last Sunday. I thought about uh, you and I hoped and prayed that you had a wonderful worship experience. Um, but I also hope that you missed me as much as I missed you. Amen, amen. This morning we're gonna begin a, a series of messages that I have entitled, God Can Do the Impossible. God Can Do the Impossible. And so this morning, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 1, we're gonna read a few verses out of Luke. And we're going to begin with the 26th verse. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. This is the word of the Lord. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel um, was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And for this short time that we shall share this morning, I want to focus our message on the fact that God can do the impossible. One of the things that I truly believe that God is displeased with when it comes to believers today is the fact that we fail to recognize that God still works miracles in our lives. In fact, there are some believers who not only fail to recognize it, they just don't believe that God still works miracles. But if I could just help you a little this morning, if you are here, then God has truly worked a miracle in your life. Because when I think of the complications of the body and, and all of the intricate parts of the things that that uh, have to work in order for us to wake up in the morning, I know that it's truly been a miracle. In fact, all of us that are in this room uh, were probably alive uh, uh, when they just figured out DNA. And so that wasn't too long ago that DNA was figured out. And when I think of the barbaric starts of medicine and how bleeding and amputations and uh, maiming of people's bodies, that was the beginning of medicine, till where we are today, I know that God still works miracles because it truly is not the hands of man, but is the God behind us that is able to help us to do the things that we have been able to accomplish. When I think of uh, a few years ago that I was in a really bad accident, I had a 
car hit me doing 100 miles an hour and to walk out of that accident only with a scratch on my head, I knew that God had worked a miracle. And I'm sure that many of you can think of different miracles of things that God has done in your life. Many of us live paycheck to paycheck, one step away from poverty, but God has sustained you all of this time. When I look around, maybe I'll just say I look, when I look at myself, I know that I haven't missed any meals. God continues to work miracles. And you know, when we're first saved, we, we tend to, to be able to recognize and see these miracles a lot clearer. We're so thankful for everything that God has done for us. It reminds me of a story of a man who just got saved. He, he just recognized that he needed God in his life, and he was anxious and, 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 and just overwhelmed with the idea of learning more and more about God. He was traveling on public transportation, sitting on a bus, reading his Bible, and every few moments, every few stops, this man would shout out, glory to God, hallelujah, amen. And, and, and he kept shouting this out, and there was a man in the front of the bus who got very agitated at the fact that this man continued to shout this out. In fact, this man was a skeptic anyway about the Bible, and he walked to the back of the bus and said, sir, what are you reading to make you shout that? He said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, disturb you, but I was just reading here how God parted the Red Sea and allowed the Israelites to walk across wet places on dry land and, and, and escape uh, uh, slavery. And the man looks at him and says, well, listen, sir, you cannot believe everything that you read in the Bible. Because the fact is, it really was not the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea. And the Reed Sea is only six inches deep. And the man looked and smiled and shook his head and acknowledged that you know, what the man had told him, and the man goes back to a seat. He's very proud that he has set the uh, Bible student straight, sets down in his seat, and the bus takes off, and they're traveling along, and, and all of a sudden, the man shouts out even louder, hallelujah, glory to God, amen. The, the guy in the front of the bus gets up and goes back there and says, sir, what are you shouting about now? Didn't I tell you? And the man's pointing at the scripture and he says, you know, I really appreciate that information that you gave me. Because of it, now I see the real miracle. The man says, well, I told you that there wasn't a miracle. The man said, yes, there was. You see, the miracle, real miracle here is that God drowned all of Pharaoh's army in six inches of water. Hallelujah, glory to God, amen. So I wanted us to know this morning that God still does miracles. And likewise this morning, we have a reason to rejoice, a purpose to praise our God. And as uh, we have entered into this Advent season, we got some glory to shout about. Because we serve a God who has done and can do the impossible. Uh, this in his letter to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3 and 20, Paul the apostle declares, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. To him be glory both in church and now forevermore. In Genesis 18 and 14, the question was asked, is there anything too hard for God? And the answer was given, comes to us through the prophet Jeremiah 32 and 17, where the prophet proclaimed saying, oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. Can anybody say that with me? Can you say, there is nothing too hard for God? Come on, say it. Because there isn't. 
I don't care what you're going through, whatever you're faced with, the truth is there is nothing too hard for God. God is able to handle whatever we are going through. And, and so here we need to understand that there's nothing, not a thing too hard for him. Just think about it for a moment. What can God not repair? What can God not renew? What can God not restore? What battle can't God fight? What door can't God open? What way can God not make? What sickness can God not heal? What need can God not meet? What pain can God not smooth? What door can God not open? What chasm can God not bridge? There is nothing that God cannot do. What justice can't God write? Nothing is too hard for God. And somebody really needs to get this in their spirit this morning and understand that uh, whenever you're faced with uh, uh, things that seem insurmountable and impossible, uh, that you don't quit. And, and the next time that, uh, that you're faced with things, you won't give up. You won't stop working or stop trying or stop giving or stop serving or stop hoping or stop praying or stop pursuing your goals and chasing your dreams and believing in tomorrow and giving God to praise because you'll remember that there's nothing too hard for God. I know some of you have heard me tell the story about a lady at my first church, Miss Freeman. I won't go into that story, but I can tell you that Miss Freeman changed the way I dress for my life. I'll never dressed the way that I did when I met Miss Freeman. But Miss Freeman uh, would put it like this. She would say, if you're sick, he's a doctor. Miss Freeman would say, if you're in trouble, he's a lawyer. If you're in bondage, he is a strong deliver, deliverer. If you're cornered, he's a way out of no way. If you're confused, he's a mind regulator. If you're heartbroken, he's a heart fixer. If you're weak, he will make you strong. If you're down, he can pick you up. If you're out, he will bring you back in because there is nothing too hard for God. When the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea, it was estimated that it was about 3.5 million of them. People who do these calculations, who work with numbers, that wouldn't be me. So I, I want you to know I'm not making this up. I had to get it from somewhere. But what they calculated was that in order for this amount of people to cross in one night, they had to cross 5,000 people shoulder to shoulder at a time. Forty years, God sustained them in the wilderness. And the Bible says that he did so that not even the soles of their shoes were worn out. They were in a camping area that was about 750 square miles. Now, to feed that many people, you needed about 1,500 tons of food a day. To haul that amount of food in, you would need two freight trains that was at least a mile long. And at today's prices, it would have cost $4.5 million a day every day for 40 years. And just to cover the bare necessities of uh, washing and, and, and bathing and drinking, they needed 11 million gallons of water a day. To move that much water, they would require a freight train with tanks, cars, spanning over 1,800 miles, 18,000 miles. And if God could provide them with food and water and protection and provision for 40 years, 
then you ought to know that whatever you're going through or having to deal with right now, God can handle it too. Uh, that our little problems is nothing compared to what our God is able to do. The things that we worry about on a daily basis. From the time I've been here, I've heard some of the worries just about our church. But I want you to know that you don't have to worry because God is able to do, even if somebody says it's impossible. Even if this morning when you walked in the door, you were believing that some things was totally impossible, you need to know that with God, all things are possible. Nothing is too hard for God. And that is the testimony in the text that we've tagged to preach this morning. In our text, we encounter Mary, who is a very familiar woman to all of us because her story is a living testimony of the power of God. She knew firsthand about the ability uh, to do, uh, uh, for God to do impossible things. In fact, it is part and parcel of the uh, motivating and yet intimidating message that re she received from the angel Gabriel when he came to announce the arrival of the Savior of the whole world. He reminded her that with God, nothing is impossible. Now, that word nothing, you, you need to understand. Any, any educators in the house? Well, I think I got it right. Uh, the word nothing is an absolute negative, meaning that there is uh, unconditionally, categorically, uh, definitely, utterly uh, nothing that God cannot do. Did y'all get that? Nothing lies beyond God's power. Nothing lies beyond God's capability. Nothing lies beyond God's capacity. Nothing uh, 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 lies beyond God's ability. God is definitely omniscient. He is completely in charge, and God is unquestionably in control. God is not limited, constricted, restricted, confined, or contained by anything or anybody. In fact, he's not contained by any place or at any time. God is sovereign. God is God all by himself. And in case you didn't know, he doesn't need you and he doesn't need I. God is able to do all things. God is not limited anywhere, but God can work everywhere. God can work in any place at any time. And see, when we look at our text, we notice here that in verse 26, Gabriel, he comes and he tells Mary of this, this, this uh, miracle that God is sending the Savior of the world. Now, a few things that we got to know about Mary. She is really just an ordinary person. But we also understand that Mary is from Nazareth. Nazareth by no means is an impressive entry on anybody's resume. And yet God chose to do the impossible at Nazareth. Nazareth was without great reputation. The name Nazareth actually meant a branch or a shoot or a sprout. And so we could say that Nazareth was like maybe a, a bean sprout sort of town. Uh, located in lower Galilee in the hill country, small mountain village with a population of about 15,000. In fact, you don't even find the name Nazareth in the Old Testament. The only time we see Nazareth mentioned in the New Testament is associated with Jesus. It was a town without reputation. Where, and, and what I need to point out here is where you've been is not where you are and not where you're going. You see, that's what reputation is all about. And so 
No matter what your reputation is, no matter what your past is, no matter what you even done in your past, you may have done it, but you're not what you did. Whenever you have Christ in your life, he makes all things new moving forward so you don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to reputation. You need to understand here that, that you are not what you used to be. Just because somebody hadn't heard of you doesn't mean that they won't hear of you. And just because you haven't done great things doesn't mean that you won't do great things. See, that's where people get caught up on reputation. But the thing that I have to point out here and stick to was that Nazareth was put on the map, made known because of Jesus. Whenever we look in the Bible and we see Nazareth, it's always associated with Jesus. And the thing that you need to understand here is that whenever you put Jesus in the mix, whenever you're adding Jesus to it, you can believe that things will change. Put Jesus in a church and that church will change. Put Jesus in your finances, your finances will change. Put Jesus in your relationships, your relationships will change. Put Jesus into a, 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 a person and that person will change. That's what we need to understand, that whenever you put Jesus in the mix, you can believe that things will change. And church, I, I need to help you to understand this morning that uh, maybe here in Eagle Lake, you may not be known. You, you may not be one of the, the big churches in, in the Mankato area. But just because you're not doesn't mean that you won't be. Because whenever you focus, whenever you call on the name of Jesus, you can guarantee that things will change. Not only will they change, but they'll change for the better. And sometimes that means that he moves some people in and he moves some people out. That's, that's what he does. That's how he works. Because in order for us to, to accept and, and have the change that he wants to make, we got to be prepared to, to let the change happen. Are you willing this morning, in this Advent season, are you willing to, to accept the fact that God is doing the impossible here in Eagle Lake? God can do the impossible in your life right now. I, I don't know what you came in that was bothering you, that you were faced with, but God told me to tell somebody here this morning, it may seem impossible. It may seem like that you'll never make it and, and you feel like giving up and you feel like quitting. I come to tell you, don't quit. Because God is working it out for your good right now. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but trust and believe that he's working it out. Oh, I, I'm a witness to that because when I think about my own life and the places that I've been and the things that I've gone through, in fact, I shouldn't even be here facing the barrel of a gun. But he didn't pull the trigger. And so if I'm here today living witness that God can do the impossible. I know I'm not the only one because somebody in here, the doctor said you were sick and you wasn't going to get well. But you're still here because God has done the impossible. They gave my mother two years to live. It's six years later because God has done the impossible. In fact, there were people who probably said your doors was going to close, but guess what? You're still here because God can do the impossible. That's all we have for today.